segmenting to succeed. So cutting up different parts of a project to sell it and targeting different market segments. So, you know, if you have a project of 100 units, it doesn't mean it's the same buyer and the same demographic that's going to buy all 100. So quite often you'll have different strategies for, for different projects. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello and welcome to episode 60 of the show. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Are your projects on track? I'm doing well. Going through a bit of a busy stage with my projects at the moment. We've just launched a sales campaign for one of my developments, so I've been very busy getting some presentation and marketing collateral finished off. It's come together really well, and I think the project looks great. Now the challenging part begins of finding prospects and converting them to buyers. On my other project, we've been in discussions with council following the public notice period, and have reached an understanding with them about what they want to see to support our application. As usual, it involves a reduction in the yield. Anyway, I'm hopeful that we now have a pathway to a permit and we are working on amending our plans and making that happen. So all in all, I have been pretty busy lately. Just before we get to today's guest, don't forget if you are interested in learning how to develop property safely and profitably, then email me about the Property Developing Mentoring Program that is available to help you get started. There's nothing like a guiding hand to show you the best way when you are starting out. So email justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com and I'll send you some further information. Okay, on to today's guest who I have been trying to get on the show for a couple of years. And thanks to a chance meeting at my son's soccer match recently, I finally got him locked in, and I think you're going to love our conversation. John Ma is one of Australia's leading project marketers and has been involved in some of Australia's most iconic and successful residential developments. He has spent more than 20 years in senior sales and marketing positions and is responsible for the sale of more than 20,000 residential properties. So he knows a thing or two about selling off the plan. We have a great discussion around marketing and selling property developments. Keep an ear out for how John approaches thinking about a marketing strategy, particularly his comments around being parachuted into an area without any digital backup, how he looks to segment, target and sell, and different ways to connect with prospects in places you may not have thought of. I think you'll enjoy this discussion, I certainly did. I started off by asking John what he would eat until he was sick, and it was something that my son loves too. I love caramel, so anything caramel, so caramel ice cream, chocolate <laughs> caramel, and that'll make me sick, that'll do it. Caramello bears will get me sick every time. <laughs> oh, that's straight out of my son's uh, playbook, caramel's his thing as well. Yeah, as soon as we go to the ice cream store, it's straight into the salted caramel flavour. Yeah, if the kids go to a party and there's a lolly bag, I'll always be looking for the caramello bear. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to finally have you on the show. I've actually been trying to get in touch or with you for about 18 months now, so I'm pretty excited to be sitting down and finally speaking with you. So thanks for taking the time. Pleasure. Can we start off by sharing with us who, well, who you are, what you do, and how you got into selling real estate? So... Um 360 Property Group, uh, we've been going for about 10 years. So I got into real estate, um, it's probably a, a, a stat I um, makes me sound old, but about uh, got 20, 30 years ago, um, I um, was up at Marimbula my, uh, on a, what you'd call a schoolies breakup, and I um, I wanted to get into real estate. I'd done work experience uh, while I was at school for a real estate agent, really enjoyed it. Uh, Wasn't that enthused about going back to study for another four years. My father was a lawyer, uh, county court judge. I wasn't enthused about, you know, the law. I I liked the law, but I, you know, probably didn't have the the acumen um, and uh, had had, had enough of schooling. So um, I was away and Dad called me and he bumped into a guy called Russell Lego who had a big business thing called Stockdown Lego and he said there was a job going in Melbourne and to get back. So I drove back and um, 
dad gave me one of his old suits and I went to the tailor and uh, I had it cut down and um, I had a pair of his old slip-ons and uh, put together a resume and there was about 50 pimple-faced kids like me in this waiting room in Glen Huntley and I got down to the final two and um, eventually I missed out on the job but they offered me a job in, in Malvern to start the property management business. And I was really lucky to, really fortunate to have good people to mentor me in those days. I had, um, obviously, Russell Lego. I had a chap by the name of Peter Rigetti, who was an amazing guy. Uh, he gave me a copy of the Residential Tenancies Act, and he said, read this. And he gave me one bit of advice. He said, be a good person, be courteous, and make sure you, you do what you say. Um, and, and that's essentially where my, my career took off. I was in property management. For a couple of years, and um, one weekend there was a, one of the sales guys was sick, and I had to fill in at an open for inspection. And I sold one, and I, I refused to go back to collecting rents that Monday. I said, "No, I'm selling now. I can do it." And the, the rest is history. Uh, well, we might go through the little bit of the history, but <laughs> what was it that you think attracted you to real estate? Um, I, I've always been a, a people's person. Um, and I, I never sort of liked the idea of being stuck by a desk. I like to get out and about and meet people. I love property and I love design. And that's what ultimately has led me into this project marketing field. Um, it's really the, my passion for design, uh, good product, uh, creating a point of difference in a project through design, quality design, to attract um, more buyers to our projects than the competition. So it's, um, you know, I've always loved beautiful homes um, and beautiful architecture and it's, it's a huge passion of mine. How did you get that first sale across the line? It was interesting. It, it, listen, I, it was in the, uh, in the late 80s when the market was absolutely booming and um, interest rates were about 22%. So um, people were buying real estate on long settlements of 120 days and and selling it as soon as they settled and making money it was going up that quickly here in Melbourne. And um, I had a guy, he came in and within five minutes he wrote me out a cheque um, and signed a contract. He, he firstly said, I'm buying this. And, you know, he was out to buy three properties that day. So it was a, it was a lucky sale. <laughs> You're thinking, I don't mind this real estate game. Yeah, I thought it was pretty easy <laughs> until the market went bust and, you know, the... The, uh, it went sideways and, you know, there was uh, what we used to call back in those days Jewish stock takes where there was development sites that were purchased and buildings burnt down to get insurance and, um, you know, the properties just sat around for months and you felt more like a cleaner, you know, uh, dusting them off rather than a, a sales agent. Um, but, you know, it, it, was, it was a really good... Um, process to go through because it really from the outset it, it toughened you up you, you had to think outside the square you had to really work hard with the uh, with the buyers develop great relationships with the buyers and a high level of trust with the the vendors to get get the two together and can you just give us a bit of a potted history from uh, of your real estate career up into 360 property group yeah so um i um I worked um, for a business called Kay and Burton. Uh, so Stockton and Lego uh, property management into sales. They were in Malvern. I wanted to get into that premium end of the market. Uh, I was offered a role at Kay and Burton. Um, I, I worked there for uh, a couple of years um, under a chap by the name of Michael Gibson, who's the managing director there today, uh, with Ross Savis. Um, a lovely man, uh, you know, taught me a lot. Uh, he's a really a doyen of the industry, uh, along with Gerald Delaney. Um, and those guys are still hard at it today and still doing as well today as they did back then. And they had a, a huge passion. They were great with people. Um, and they were great with the art of sales. So, um, you know, I learned a lot from those guys. I, I then had, uh, not pressure, but... Um, I wanted ultimately to run my own business um, and my father was always saying to me, you've got to go and get your qualification. So I went back to school and uh, studied and got my full licence and while I was doing that I got offered um, a two-week job 
um, part time on weekends, uh, helping a, a family friend who was developing a building in the city called Gordon Place, and um, that was one of the first inner city apartment buildings. And I, my role was to basically escort the agents through the building. Um, it was a the building had a central atrium and it was a sort of hotel complex and we were selling hotel rooms, service departments and there wasn't a lot of security so I was staying there on weekends while the customers were coming through and assisting the agents and the, the project was so popular that there was huge crowds of people so to keep them entertained I'd run off to the cake shop and buy cakes and while the agents were doing these tours one on one and then I soon sort of got to a point where I thought hang on there's a better way of doing this why don't I do some group tours so I'd take 10 at a time and I'd take them around the various apartments with a bunch of sold stickers in my back pocket and people would buy one and I'd close the door and put a sold sticker on it and and that'd create a sense of urgency you know so it was all about you know developing my sales skills in, in terms of project marketing and um and I was offered a job, and because I'd committed to my father for finishing my studies, I said I could only work weekends, which really uh, was one of the best jobs I ever had because I was getting paid, I think, 500 bucks a sale, um, and I'd m- make one or two sales every weekend, and I got to live down the coast and study at the Gordon in Geelong, so I got to surf and study during the week and make a couple of sales on the weekend. It was great. Um, if it wasn't for my wife and four kids, I'd probably be doing the same thing today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always leave the, the family, the kid thing, uh, stories to the side, John, <laughs> so we don't get sidetracked. I always said when I look back on photos when I had lots of hair, it's like that was before I got married and had kids. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> I can obviously say the same thing to you. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> and so then what happened from there? Um... So the, that business I was working for, as soon as I finished my course, they offered me a full-time role. And I, um, after about 12 months, I was made a director. And that was Hume Real Estate. And they were one of the first pure project marketers in Melbourne. And that was a really exciting journey for me because we were doing something completely different to the, the standard domestic residential real estate agent we were selling off the plan we were doing buildings like the original Como building Uh, in South Yarra we were doing all the towers on St Kilda Road we were doing a lot of work for Beckton back then Max Beck and Michael Buxton who's now Mab Corporation Uh, we were doing all their work at Jollymont Rail Yards a lot of projects in South Yarra and Turak Um, and and that the learning curve there was immense Um, after sort of 12 months in that position uh, you know I, I, it was for me it was like a, a duck to water I really was uh, engaged in the role and, and really um, loved doing what I was doing I was made a director and I ran the sales team there and uh, eventually um, Barry Shepherd um, and Maurice Pittard who started the business um, went their separate ways and decided to uh, uh, sell the business they sold it back to Kay and Burton um, and I didn't want to go back to Kay and Burton and I was offered a role with Mervac when Mervac first came to Melbourne so I started on their first project in Melbourne which was Beacon Cove so worked at uh, Beacon Cove um, for a number of years um, that was a pretty big project wasn't it yeah big project big project and how many um, units was in that or it's, it's, we're sort of still going today, yeah. you know. So there was, you know, while we were there, we sold three or four uh, high-rise apartment buildings, but uh, you know, hundreds of homes. Yeah, um, and it was one of the largest uh, inner urban developments of its time, and it's it's still been a very successful development, both for the Mervac and the purchases themselves. There's been some great capital growth there, so we were involved in that. Um, so I worked for Mervac for three years and then um, I was offered a partnership in a, would you believe it or not, a surfing business. And so to my father's disgust, I followed my, my passion and I moved up to Sydney and I had a warehouse up there and I was manufacturing surfing, surf life saving equipment and selling it uh, 
uh, yeah, I had two partners down here in uh, Melbourne in Torquay, and it was a lot of fun, but a financial disaster. <laughs> and uh, I had um, uh, during that, towards the end of the process, as the business was going south, I had colleagues uh, sort of knocking at the factory door saying, "Listen, we hear you're, you're the uh, a great project marketer. We want to start a project marketing division." come and work for us in Melbourne. We want you to set up the Melbourne business. I'd spoken to a few people in the industry, architects and builders who knew of me. And um, I said, no, no, I'm not leaving Sydney. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll give you a job in Sydney to, to help, help us up here in Sydney, but we want you to eventually move back to Melbourne. So I worked in Sydney for a while. Uh, we sold a site uh, to a, client in Sydney um, in Port Melbourne uh, called HMAS Lonsdale, the big towers on the beachfront, to a Sydney developer who did a joint venture with Nonda Katsalidis from Fender Katsalidis and um, that brought me back down to Melbourne to, to launch that. And, um, should have got them to buy a surfboard with every sale and <laughs> yeah. give it to the buyers. <laughs> I should have. Propped I should up, have propped up both your businesses. Yes. <laughs> but uh, so so in that process, um, we had a, a PR company engaged, and uh, we had a, a launch function at another project I picked up here in Melbourne on Queens Road, and um, uh, it was a freezing night in winter, and uh, there was a, a, a beautiful looking lady young girl out the front who was working for the PR agency, you know, in the cold. And, you know, after the sort of the night had finished, I walked out there, gave him a jacket and invited her out for dinner. And, you know, uh, 20 plus years later, we've got four kids and I'm still here in Melbourne. So that's how I met my wife and came back to Melbourne. And um, uh, my project marketing career really took off because I had her support. Interesting. Well, there's a lot that I'd like to ask you. <laughs> Based and there's on a lot there. of other uh, bits in between. So I, I worked for Colliers for nine years, started their project marketing business here in Melbourne. Uh, I was a national director there, so I oversaw the uh, Brisbane office um, and the Gold Coast office. Uh, we had um, the guys around Sydney. I'd occasionally go up there, but they um, I reported into those guys who now run CBRE, Justin Brown, who's a, a great mate and uh, a doyen of the industry, um, and uh, had a great time at... Um, at Collier's, learnt a lot, had great support there, uh, but always wanted to run my own business. Um, and, um, you know, got to a point where I I uh, was, during the GFC, I had a, a, a lot of clients that um, I'd done work for, including Beckton and, and Australand, that uh, were in trouble and uh, wanted my help. And um, so I stepped out on my own and started 360 and... Uh, they're still my clients today, so um, you know I had a uh, had an original business plan of um, selling 450 apartments in the first 12 months, and was working out of um, a very modest display suite uh, that um, we were about to launch for uh, the Builders Icon Construction. We're doing a develop in South Yarra, and. Um, we were in there temporarily until they got their permit and um, they got their permit really quickly so we had to move offices and we moved to South Melbourne. Um, launched their project and launched a number of others and uh, by the end of the first 12 months, you know, we were hoping to sell 450 apartments, we sold 1,300 and we had eight staff and the business started to grow and, uh, you know, we're still here today, 10 years later. And, right. uh, yeah, it's been a great journey. Awesome. Well, there's a lot to unpack here, so you better cancel all your calls <laughs> and we'll be here for the rest of the day while we talk through all this. Uh, you, you mentioned how you started selling off the plan in the early days back in Melbourne. What, what was different back then about selling off the plan? As you said, it was new to Melbourne. What was it that was different or that you had to do differently back then? And then following on from that, what is different today from what you were doing back then in terms of off-the-plan selling? Yeah, good question. So when the the -the off-the-plan sales phenomenon started in Melbourne, it was a by-product of the commercial office boom. 
we'd just been through a commercial office boom in the late 80s where we had a lot of premium office buildings, A-grade and office buildings built along the areas of St Kilda Road and the CBD. And when the market came off, uh, there was a lot of redundant office buildings sitting around that no one wanted to tenant. So uh, a few savvy developers like Hudson Conway, um, who did number one uh, Albert Road, was one of the first buildings in Melbourne, um, Beckton, uh, bought these old buildings, that was the old police headquarters at the time, and basically converted them into apartments. So it was very different back then where you'd have an existing building and you could point to it, you could walk through it, you could show them the views. But the perception was, how are you going to change this old office building in here with old lifts into this sparkling new apartment building? Um, it's not like today where you, you start with a clean slate uh, in most cases and, and you'd be showing beautiful renders and everything else and saying this is what it's going to look like. We almost had a, a slight hurdle we had to get over and say, yes, we, we can change this to look like this. And, and those days, um, you know, the first off-the-land projects, the Gordon Place one I spoke of, they are all refurbs. Um, and there was a lot of refurbs along St Kilda Road, and it wasn't until the likes of, you know, the big institutional developers came to Melbourne, like Mervac, who had been doing off-the-plan projects in Sydney, uh, started to do completely new product, um, which was, you know, purely off the plan um, and in those days uh, and still today they were doing big elaborate display suites um, the technology and the marketing has all changed uh, but the, the fundamentals of trying to replicate the premium product and sell down from that uh, is still where, where we're at today in a lot of these projects. And so what are the things that you're doing today to, to market and sell off the plan? Well, I think the the thing about project marketing is it, it's forever evolving. We're in a dynamic market, and if you if you to remain relevant in this industry, you've got to evolve and you've got to pivot. And we're pivoting because the market's changing. It's soft now, and you know we we talk about uh, there isn't a one size fits all approach in project marketing. So you you don't have the same formula that you roll across every project. What we do is, and we were talking to our sales team, we had one of our, we're very lucky to have some really long-standing staff at 360 and one of our, you know, senior sales executives here was uh, training our younger people on Monday about segmenting to succeed. So cutting up different parts of a project to sell it and targeting different market segments. So, you know, if you have a project of 100 units, it doesn't mean it's the same buyer and the same demographic that's going to buy all 100. So quite often you'll have different strategies for, for different projects and there's obviously the market's evolved and there's, there's always different uh, channels to, to push the product through and different marketing sources. You know, social media uh, have been a big trend and different styles of social media, but... I think, um, you know, if, if you look at trends currently, there's uh, video's been a massive trend over the last uh, five years. But uh, podcasts are huge at the moment. So people are saying ears are the new eyes. So, you know, you're on to it, Justin. <laughs> on trend? Yeah, yeah, you're on trend. So <laughs> podcasts are massive. So, um, you know, there's, there's people in their cars on their way home. You know, everyone, I listen to podcasts twice a day. And, um, you know, I'm sick of listening to the bad news on, on the radio and I love listening to your podcasts and other podcasts. So it's... Um, You're going to be listening to this one when it comes out, uh, driving along listening to yourself? If I suffer from <laughs> insomnia, I will. <laughs> I'll probably uh, go to sleep listening yeah, to this. Most people say they don't like listening to their own voice. So. No, I don't. <laughs> um, so it's, it's interesting and it, it, it's really... Uh, it's a lot of people, um, if you look at trends... Um, in the market and the way people are selling projects, um, you know, it's taking a deeper dive into the way you're doing things. And I was only in a market like we're in where it's soft and developers are struggling for sales, I'm finding a lot of the larger, um, more reputable clients that have been in the market for a long time are sort of starting to come back and saying, John, can you have a look at what we're doing? And they're doing all the right things, but it's kind of the one percenters that they're missing out on. I had someone in this boardroom yesterday and 
uh, they've been in the Melbourne market for 35 years, a great developer, and they're using social media. I said, are you using social media? And he said, yeah, we're using social media. And I said, so, I said, what's your lead response process? He says, oh, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, you know, is it automated? Do you put them in a nurture campaign? Uh, do, you, do you filter them through a call centre? You know, do you, you know, what's the whole process around that? And he said, oh, well, we, we get the leads and we send them to the agent. I said, well, how do, you, how do you monitor how quickly they respond to the leads and how effective they are and where they've come from? Oh, we don't really. So you could say, OK, if I'd stopped there and said you're using social media and moved on, I thought, oh, OK, well, they're using it, but they're not using it effectively. So, you know, you, you hear all these real estate coaches and everyone sort of touting the same phrase, speed is the new currency, you know. Everyone wants stuff now. So, you know, with social media, we find that... Um, rather than disengaging our sales team with l- huge volumes of low-quality leads, we'll put someone in between them, like a contact centre based here locally that will qualify the customers and get onto them immediately and be available at their time when they're shopping. So, you know, I, I think you've got to respect what your staff are good at and employ good people to do good things and the right jobs. And you don't want to have your salespeople working after hours, uh, ringing back social media leads at, you know, 9, 10 o'clock at night while people are on their phones during ad breaks on TV, um, creating issues on the home front where you can employ someone that's more professional and more targeted at that role to get a better result. And then qualifying those leads, passing them on to the the professional sales team who know how to sell off the plan, know how to engage the customer at an appointment and know how to get a sale. So that's the, the detail is where we're at now. Yes, I've um, heard you talking about one percenters on some of your 360 property group social channels, which mm. I thought was really good. And I agree that when it gets soft, you do really need to focus on the one percenters. My question is, we're coming off a really heated period in the market where it was pretty straightforward to pick up off the plan sales. And so do you think people have gotten uh, not lazy but did people just get used to it being easy and they've forgotten how you used to have to sell off the plan or are we in a completely new dynamic now where the market has shifted so much and you really just need to have new approaches to how you're selling off the plan Uh, good question Uh, yeah it's a completely different market and you do need a different approach and it's, um, you know, you, you have to have a deeper understanding of the market. And, you know, we've got to be more selective in terms of the projects we take on, the reputations of the developer. Um, so, and understanding the market to be able to produce the right product that'll sell itself. And that's the thing, it's in, in a strong market, um, you know, you, it'll cover all your sins and all your faults but in a soft market you can't hide anywhere you've you've got to have the right product you've got to have the right people and you've got to have the right process to get the projects away and for us it's about working with the right developers um, that have a good reputation that people can leverage off have a strong story behind the development have a unique point of difference um, and um, are agile enough to adapt and change to the market quickly you know, we don't want to work for uh, developers that uh, have, have large layers of management where it takes months to make a decision and turn the ship around, you know, in a market like this because it's evolving so quickly and there's so many different dynamics at play. You know, we've got to work um, directly with the principals and they've got to be involved in every deal and be passionate about it. And they'll be successful in this market and they're the ones that we're working with now and we're, we're getting the sales away. Can you give me a bit more detail around what that looks like when you say we want to be involved in the design to ensure that it's the right product for the right market? How do you determine what the right product is? Like something that you're looking at now, how would you say it needs to be different to something that was you know, two years ago? Is it the size? Is it the finished spec? Is it the location? Is it a little bit of column A and column B? Yeah, it, it, it depends. Um, so in the market, um, we're a, 
where we are at today. We're we're a real estate business, so we work on commission, and that's how, that's how we generate our income. So we go to where the sales are, and we chase the stock that we know is moving in a market like today. So we're finding that because finance is uh, becoming more and more difficult to obtain for in terms of mortgage finance. Uh, we're, we're finding that one of the strongest market segments is the downsizers who are cashed up and have a less reliance on mortgage finance. And they tend to be chasing sort of the more premium and larger projects, uh, larger apartments rather, um, in the suburban areas of Melbourne and um, Sydney uh, and uh, Brisbane. So, you know, Noosa, for example, that's a downsizer project we're doing at the moment. So we're looking at that sort of stock. Um, and, you know, there's less volume, uh, but there's more activity in that market. So we're doing uh, a larger number of smaller projects, uh, which require more manpower and more focus. Um, and there's a higher level of uh, understanding involved in terms of uh, designing the product that will uh, attract that particular market for that particular area. And if, you know, we... we we have what we call a, a health check in here on our projects. So we, we're always monitoring the medium house price in a suburb where we're selling to an owner-occupier. And we say, OK, if it's a... And it, this, is, this is only a rough rule and there is anomalies in this, like if you're on the waterfront or something like that, but if you're in a suburban area of Melbourne and you're trying to sell a three-bedroom apartment... You, you're looking at a value of about 70 to 75 percent in the medium house price, right? If you're looking at a two bedroom, you're looking at about 55 percent. So if someone sells their home, they'll buy a two bedroom apartment because they they're mentally downsizing as well, and they're thinking, okay, well, half price is the, the big home that that works for me, or a, a luxury three bedroom, brand new. 75%, and that'll give them, them some residual cash to put into their super, renovate their beach house or travel or, or do all those things. So, you know, we do a bit of a health check there before we sort of jump into into bed with a developer. Most of the developers we're working for today we've worked for for a long time, so we know them. They've got great reputations that you can point to on, on the landscape and the skyline of Melbourne. Um, people can walk through existing products that they've done in the past uh, and it makes our job so much easier. Yeah, and I, I know another agent friend of mine made a really interesting comment. He said, also in this market, you're coming up against the dinner table uh, views and attitudes of your friends when you're looking at buying something off the plan. So if you're looking at buying a three-bedroom apartment in wherever that you're going to spend two million bucks on, you mention that around the dinner table to your friends at the moment, they tell you you're crazy because the market's soft and the prices are going down. Why on earth would you buy an apartment now? So you're also competing with that. Yeah, that, that's right. And I think um, when it comes to real estate, everyone's always got an opinion and uh, there's always that that dinner party conversation, uh, that that uh, conversation uh, on the soccer sidelines, like we had just a couple of weeks ago <laughs> when we bumped into each other. But it's um, you know, it, and I and I love people's opinions, and you learn from them, and and it gives you a good barometer of the the general public and the way they're thinking and the way you need to mould your advertising or your product in order to um, be successful in your sales campaigns. Um, yeah, it's. I think as a result of the soft market, um, you know, the 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 values have come back. There's no doubt the values have come back, and there's good buying. Um, if you could buy at the bottom of the market, you would. Are we at the bottom? Who knows, right? I haven't got a crystal ball. No one will tell us we're at the bottom. But I think real estate, as an owner occupier, as an investor, for me personally, and the advice I always give is, is a long term play. If you're a speculator. I always say, don't get into property, go to Crown Casino. You know, real estate, you've got to have a, a, a minimum of a five-year window. Minimum. And I think if you're buying today, sure, if the market goes down another 1% or 2%, it, you, you're going to cover that well and truly in the next five to ten years. So if it's your personal home um, and you want to be in a particular location, you want to be around your friends and family, you want to be close to transport shops and it's ticking all the boxes... You know, it's, it's that time and that time's right for you to buy it. Buy it today is my advice. And then just going back to your to 
question about what you then try and do to make sure the product is right for the market. So you've got your, your median, uh, median price indicator. What else do you do? Do you look at the floor plates that are proposed and you've got a three bedroom that's 100 square me- 180 square metres, for example, do you then say it needs to be bigger or smaller? So you need a new interior designer? Where we start is essentially, before we go into any project plans, we get an understanding of where the opportunity is in the market. And the way in which we do that is we look at sales data, what's sold and what the trend in sales are, what rates per square metre, how many three bedrooms, how many bathrooms, how many car parks. And then we we overlay that with current inquiry data. So we look at inquiry data and we see where it's highest or where there is the highest opportunity. So in saying that, Justin, there might be, um, it might be the highest level of inquiry for uh, let's call it product in a, a particular price range. So there might be apartments in the eight to nine hundred price point, and they might be two bedroom, two bathroom in say an area like Malvern. Uh, but there is absolutely no product. So if twenty percent of the total inquiry is for that product in that price range and it isn't being supplied, it means there's an opportunity to supply, it. and that twenty percent might mean five hundred inquiries. So if you do a little project of 30 or 40 apartments, you'd say, okay, well, let's do a higher proportion of two bedroom, two bathroom in that eight to 900 because there's an opportunity here that hasn't been satisfied. So it's about history and it's about current inquiry data. So sales history and current inquiry and seeing where there is an opportunity. Um, And that opportunity's got to to match um, that uh, affordability metric that we, we spoke of previously. And then that begins to shape, I mean, size is then, and then, and then, or uh, It is. So then we look at sizes. So the sizes ultimately will dictate where the price point ends up. Um, and so there's, there's always that tension of saying, okay, um, and we often come across this where we have, um, we get independent research done, or the developers often will go off and get independent research at a shopping centre. And we get the research back and they don't ask the question of what price range you're in. So they'll say, oh, you know, what sort of apartment would you like? And the standard response will be, I want a huge apartment, three bedrooms, and I want three car parks, and I'd love to drive a Rolls Royce and marry a supermodel. But what people want and what they'll accept are two different things. So we'll say, well, what price would you pay for that? And they'd say, oh, I'll only pay 700 so it's totally out of their ballpark. But if we can sort of extrapolate that information out of the research we do and we say, okay, what finishes are important to you? Do you need an ensuite? You know, do you want fully ducted heating? Uh, is, is view important? And all these sorts of things. And then we can uh, extrapolate that data into a brief that we give the architects to refine the mix, yeah? And then you've got to, then you've always got the tension there of um, satisfying the local town planning regulations in terms of um, uh, mix of product because you know there's certain areas of Melbourne where you've got to supply a certain number of three bedroom apartments, car parking ratios, etc. But um, what I've had to learn over my uh, career is the development process is never perfect. So it's not like a production line where you put your town planning permit in and it comes out in two months and you go to sell it and it'll be another month and then I can set my sales people up for the next project. It doesn't happen that way. And, you know, I, I, I've had to learn to become patient and accept change and changes in legislation, town planning or legal le- purchasing legislation, stamp duty legislation, and adapt and pivot. And I think, you know, that's that's how I've grown personally because I, I've... I've I've learnt to evolve um, and uh, grow bolder, not older. And that's my thing, is, is just changing. And, you know, you come into a marketplace like we're in now and, you know, a, a younger John Ma uh, in his 20s would have said, geez, this is shocking, what am I doing now? I could be surfing. But now I look at it and I'm thinking, wow, what an opportunity we're in. You know, my competitors are falling by the wayside. 
uh, there's fewer developers, fewer developments being launched, fewer developers out there. The only developers that are still in the market are the professional ones that have got a strong track record and do it right. What a great time to produce something different and build my market share. I'm thinking, wow, there's, there's opportunities in the market. And that's what gets me excited today. So when you talk about going bolder, what what things are you doing now that you think, this is pretty bold, I'm, I'm uh, putting it out there? Yeah, well, I, I suppose in, you know, it, it, today's discussion is probably an example of that. Um, you know, I, in my younger days, I, I didn't have the confidence and I was reserved. I, I, I wouldn't want to have these sort of discussions publicly. Uh, my videos that you've seen online, you know, they, it, it's as as I'm more comfortable in my own skin and and, and my own knowledge. I'm I'm comfortable to to impart that uh, publicly to the the buying public or the developing public. Um, and I often say to many of my guests, they've definitely got the look for podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly have. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, you're not coming back. I know. <laughs> No, I think you're actually you do really well on your um, social media channels. You know, the videos you do on Insta actually provide quite a bit of value. So I, th- I think you're selling yourself short a little bit there. So yeah, we, we, that's what we're about. So you know, in this um, business, we're about um, it, it's not always about uh, for us. Success is is, is not measured by. Um, it's not measured by the, our balance sheet. It's often measured by the growth of our employees and ourselves and the success of, of our customers. Um, because, you know, what goes around comes around in this business. And if you're putting in the effort, and it's a tough market, you know when you come out the back of a tough market, you know, you're going to be in a, in a t- tremendous position. And, you know, it's, it's putting yourself in these tough positions situations where you've, you're forced into evolving, you're forced into change and looking at opportunities is where you grow the most personally and as a business. Yeah, I often say to people who email me or when I'm talking to other people about the challenges that you face and there always are in developing, you just have to learn to, and try to embrace them. It's the, only, it's the only way to kind of get through it, I think. <laughs> and and it's, it's been interesting as a business, you know, over the 10 years we've we've seen that we, we get to a point where we say, okay, well, we're going to try this and, we're, you know, this is, wow, we've got some great new ideas and let's just, you know, let's get out there and implement these new strategies. And we, we have these great trajectories of growth and then we'll flatten off because we haven't evolved. And we find that we've got to evolve and change things and mix things up again and, and look for change and look for learnings. And, and then we take off again and, you know, it's... We're, we've never been in the market like we're in today. You know, the, the, the outside factors that are influencing the market, have, we've never experienced factors like this, or the, particularly the number of factors that we're experiencing now in this marketplace. So there's no one that's been through this type of, of cycle before, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting one. We're all going to learn something out of it. It's interesting that you touch on that. So what are the sort of headline thoughts that you have just about the current environment that we're in? As you say, there's a whole range of factors at play that are help that have subdued the market. Yeah, so I, I, you know, con- consumer confidence is down um, and that's a big thing, but I think it's, it's a combination of things. It's uh, the off-the-plan, um, particularly the apartment market, if we put the townhouse... Uh, product aside for the moment was always fueled by um, the foundations of offshore sales. So the big apartment towers that were getting all the publicity in the CBD, were, the majority of that product was being sold offshore. So since the stamp duties have changed um, and the ability for these foreign buyers to get money, particularly out of China, those sales have dried up to you know in the vicinity of ten percent of what they used to be, ten to probably twenty percent. They're, they're just a, a mine. A, minute number of what they used to be so we've we're finding that um you know that that volume is out of the market so that it's it, for, for me personally and for our business um we're finding that the market's come back to traditional fundamentals you know you, you used to be able to um if if there was a the local market wasn't accepting your product um you could still take it off shore and you, it was like you had um 
a uh, it was almost like a, a safety shoot. You, you could pull another lever for sales and say, okay, well, it's not selling well here. Let's go over to uh, Beijing and do an exhibition over there, and you'd sell them over there. You can't do that anymore. So it's 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 got to stand on its own fundamentals, which are you know particularly driven by local demand dynamics. So the local customers, it's got to stand on its own two feet. So it's got to be attractive. It's got to be readily lettable, and it's got to have an inherent retail value once it's built. So you're looking at the local buyers because they're here, have the ability to look at the track record of the developer, look at the track record of the builder, look at the track record of the agent, uh, and understand that they're dealing with a reputable organisation that's um, you know put good people into good investments over the years. So uh, from for, from a personal point of view, I think it's um, we've we've got back uh, to. Uh, better fundamentals that are going to drive a, a better market into the future once, you know, the, the economics uh, fix themselves up. Uh, how long that's going to take, I don't know. Um, sounds like we're going to have a new government in and we'll see how they go, but um, I'm not expecting great changes quickly, particularly this year. I wanted to ask you about some things that government could do, I guess particularly state government, they have the biggest levers that they can pull with regards to the property market. Are there any of you think that they should be pulled? Uh, well, there's plenty. Um, I think... Um, being being reasonable, not just... Uh, yeah, so I, I think one of the biggest... There's, 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 there's two things that are, are really going to hurt... Um, the market and one thing is affordability and that's both from a purchasing point point of view but also a renting point of view so rents rental vacancy rates at an all-time low you know 0.5 of percent in some suburbs um, particularly in a city here um, rents are starting to escalate you know you we will be getting into a situation soon where there's sort of rental auctions where you you know you're buying to get in and people won't be able to afford to live uh, in a city where majority of all the the, the work is and the, um, you know, the commercial um, outcomes, or the, rather the the the, um, the CB in and around the CBD, so I think uh, you know we're going to have a rental crisis. So I think we need to stimulate investment back into in the city rentals because the demand and um, supply dynamics uh, is askew at the moment because there's not enough uh, rental accommodation because there isn't enough investment investment purchases buying apartments uh, in and around the CBD to provide accommodation for inner city workers. So that's one thing, and I think um, the majority of the uh, or a large majority of the purchases of these apartments were were foreigners. Um, so I think. Uh, they could certainly remove the, the foreign taxes and start to simu- stimulate foreign investment again, which will uh, have a knock-on effect for the construction industry. I think the construction industry currently at the moment um, is uh, is being uh, subsidised by the government infrastructure projects in and around uh, you know the new tunnels and rail uh, sector, and I think once that work sort of slowly uh, starts to tear off, you know we're going to have some big issues in that sector, and I think we're going to have to. The government needs to be a little bit more forward thinking and and start to prepare for that. And I think you know the, the housing sector and the construction industry is the backbone of our economy economy here in Victoria, and I think you know we need to look at getting investors back into the into the market and stimulating the housing sector. So that's one thing. I think we could, um, we need to, we do need to do more for first home buyers. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it's getting harder and harder for them to get into the market. They're getting pushed further and further out uh, onto the suburban rim, which is costing the government more and more money to extend infrastructure out into the, this suburban fringe. And I think by offering larger subsidies to um, first home buyers, particularly for inner city apartments, will help maintain the cost of that suburban sprawl and push people up in the CBD rather than out. Yeah, I'd like to see some returns to some off-the-plan concessions to really encourage people to 
buy off the plan because at the moment there's just nothing there. Yeah, the stamp duty concessions and all those things. So, you know, that's just put a screaming halt on investment in yeah. off the plan. Yeah. Mm. All right, let's turn a little bit to tactical stuff. Are there any go-to tactical activities that you're going to use in a campaign or what advice do you have for must-haves? The, the one place where we always start, uh, before we do anything on a new project, uh, we have a project team meeting internally and um, it, I sort of like to use the analogy like... Uh, they're special ops uh, salespeople. And I say, okay, if, imagine if I threw you into the forest, and we'll call that forest uh, Hampton, for example, and you had no weapons. So you had to go and capture some sails, and you had no real estate dot coms in your, in your artillery bag. You had no domains. You had no social media. You had to get into a certain suburb, and you have to infiltrate those suburbs and find the buyers. How would you do it? So that's where we start with all our projects. We call it a market infiltration strategy. So we we look at community groups, uh, we look at influencers, um, and we develop relationships with those to get those low-hanging sales and establish uh, sales in the the local neighbourhood. So if we can't establish sales in that local neighbourhood, the product's wrong. And that's generally where we'll do a lot of testing with our, our product up front before we go to a more mainstream campaign. So, you know, things like uh, engaging the local retail traders association and having some exclusive events for them. So if we can engage them, uh, get them involved in the project, uh, they speak highly of the product because they were involved in helping giving us some feedback in terms of what that community likes and how they they behave locally and what the idiosyncrasies are of that community, um, you know, we, we want to engage them. There, there might be certain community groups, uh, large community groups in certain areas and if uh, we, we stick to Hampton for a moment, it's the Sandringham Yacht Club, it's got a lot of members. So understanding them, their, their demographic, their age and the opportunities there and trying to infiltrate that community and uh, you know, get some sales out of that, that 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 community group. So we go in and we understand the community, create some relationships, and try and get some early sales first, and then see if there's any trends in those sales. So then we can leverage off those trends. So if there's trends from a particular group that behave in a particular way or have a particular profession, then we can, uh, you know, adapt our marketing strategy around that group to get a lower cost of sale for our developer clients. So that's where we start. And then what we do is we we build, um, we get better intelligence on our, our, our target market who... You know, we've done the, that anecdotal research about who, who the market is, but then that sort of helps confirm our assumptions. And then we will fine-tune, like we, we, we spoke about social media before, you know, we build look-alike audience based on the behaviours of these people rather than just sort of spray and play sort of marketing where you, know, you can spend hundreds of thousands of your know, developers' funds and, you know, get low-quality leads. So we're about uh, quality, not quantity. So we can produce a lower cost per sale because we want more money to be invested into the project and the end product rather than into the marketing campaign. Okay. And I know in your video, social media videos you've talked about one percenters. I think uh, one of them you talked about having a play area for kids while, so the, at the display suite or the open so that the parents could be focused on the sales conversation and not have to worry about the kids. That's right, yeah. Which I liked. I thought that was really good. Yeah. Are there any others that you can share with us? Uh, listen, there's, it, it, there isn't one. Yeah. And it's for us, it's all about um, making the most of every opportunity. So, you know, one of the things we do as a business is, um, if you, and you may have not noticed this, but if you go into a 360 uh, display suite where we're representing um, one of our fabulous clients, you'll always notice the same scent. Uh, we have our own 360 candles. So, you know, it's... It, it's essence de mar. 
<laughs> I wish, I wish, but it's it, it's really uh, making um, you know attracting all those senses. So you know, we look at smell, um, we uh, we look at sound, and having music playing in the background, and we look at light. So you know, simple things that drive me crazy. If I wander into a display and they, you know, there's a, a bedroom set up and they don't have the bedside lamps on to create that mood, drives me crazy. We don't have the, the, the appropriate music playing for the appropriate target market. And I see a lot of domestic agents doing this well where they have playlists for different style of homes for different target markets. And, you know, we've been doing that for a number of years and it works really well. So they're just one percenters, um, you know, uh, selling large apartments using large floor plans. Because perception's reality. So if, you know, I go into the display suites where they'll hand you an A4 piece of paper trying to sell you a 200 square metre penthouse, and I'm like, jeepers, that looks tiny. Is that tiny? Oh, no, no, it's just the piece of paper that's tiny. I'm like, well, why would you do that? So it, it's, it's about one percenters. It's about having that customer journey figured out. So, okay, what's the first thing you want the customer to see when they walk into that display centre or, or they, they arrive at that display centre and how you want them to travel through and experience that space is really important to us. So, you know, there, there is a simple process of, of, of telling the story um, that makes it simple for the customer to be able to logically understand what's going on in order to make the sale. Uh, it's interesting that you talk up or that you've mentioned the idea of telling a story because that's something that keeps coming up on my show. What's When you talk about telling a story, what are the components or what does that look like to you? I, I think, you know, it's I've just come from a meeting, uh, a project workshop with marketing people and architects and, you know, the one thing I always ask the architects is, well, what's the story behind this? You know, why? What did you see in this site? Why did you develop it this way? What was the inspiration behind the facade or the lobby or the spaces you've created? And I think um, to, to be a good real estate agent, to be a good project marketer, to be a good developer, to be a good architect, you've got to be able to tell a great story and develop a great story. And for me, it's so important. And, you know, if we don't have a story behind a development and we're just doing it because it's a homogenous product, we're not doing it. Because we've got to have a distinct point of difference in every project we develop in conjunction with our developer clients um, and project market to create a real point of difference to them. And, if, you know, we see a lot of developers coming through these doors and they don't have a story and they have a more homogenous product and they're the ones that we knock back because to get true traction you've got to have a compelling story behind your development and it's it's critical absolutely critical and so what was the kind of response you were looking from the architect or how do you then tease something out of them to find what would be the ne- the nub of a story well the, the, the first thing um it was uh, the, the question I asked the architect today was, in fact, Fender Cat's a leader, so I, I said to them, what was your reaction when you first saw the site? You know, how did you feel? What opportunity did you see? And that's that's where it all starts, you know? And that's, for anyone, it's about the, lo- you know, it's about the location, feeling comfortable in the location, and then uh, because you're comfortable in that location, what inspired them to design the product and that, that was the question I asked today to try and uh, tease out uh, the, the, the story and then you just start building something around that well it's it, it generally a genuine story mm. so there's always a genuine story behind a, a development and why the developer bought this location and bought this site um, you know they'll, they'll and I must preface that by saying that it's it generally our clients because we like to only work with clients that want to create a, a real point of difference in their development. If someone wants to just do a, another homogenous tower uh, where there's no real point of difference and sell it on price alone, you know, it's really hard for us to add value there. You know, if it's, it's price alone, it's, 
you know, for us to go into the market knowing we're just going to compete on price, it's like the lowest form of competition. We don't want to be involved. You know, we, we want to compete on, on product and quality and reputation and, and a point of something unique, you know, a real point of difference. So it's the developer will, will generally lead that way because he said, I bought this site because, John, I want you to have a look at this. This is an amazing site and I bought it because... And then I, 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 my whole life I've been thinking about, you know, I've loved this style of architecture and, you know, I've seen pieces of it in this neighbourhood but no one's done it well and so I've decided to really employ the best architecture that specialises in whatever style of architecture, whether it's deco or whatever, and I've developed this product. Um, and I think it's really going to appeal to the local community because there's a lack of this style of product or a lack of this amenity that I've put in the building or whatever it is, you know. Um, and we've worked with some amazing developers like, um, and, and we're very, very lucky and, and I feel very fortunate to, to work alongside the clients that we are. And, you know, when I first started my career, I never thought I'd end up in this position, I, you know, and, and I'm so fortunate to work with, you know, the big institutional clients we've got and the, and, and the large privates and small privates and, and, and the common thread with them is they're all really good people and I still have fun today if I wasn't having fun I wouldn't do it and if I'm not having fun I don't want to work with people you know we're too old and silly for that now and it's you know if we're working with the right clients and we're working to create something purely unique and striking that gets great traction in the market and, and we deliver a quality outcome you know, that's something I'm proud of and I can sort of point to on the skyline and say I was involved in that project. I wanted to ask about those developers that you've been involved with, the ones that you think are the quality uh, the quality developers. What is it about them that you like or that you admire or that you think enables them to be successful and to stand out? Um, the first thing is that the, the best developers I've worked with are the ones that are really hands-on. So they're deeply involved in the process and they have a deep understanding of the marketplace. So they understand where the opportunity is and there's a lot of thought that goes into purchasing the site. Um, and generally they've got great relationships because of their personal involvement in the process. So they have long-standing personal relationships with great consultants. Um, you know, they're the better ones because they have a, a, a good feeling for the market and they have a good feeling for when the market turns and they, they have the ability to be agile and, and adapt. And the beauty about uh, project marketing and selling off the plan is you can adapt and fine-tune your, your, your project uh, on the run. You know, during the sales process, you can amalgamate units, you can amend floor plates, uh, product mix and, and everything else. So um, the... the you know, being hands-on is, is really important. Um, the, 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 the other big thing is um, being a collaborator, not a dictator. So we've had developers come in here and say, this is what we're going to do, here's a price list, and this is where you're going to sell from, and here's your ad schedule. And we're like, uh, this isn't going to work for us. Because we, we don't have buy-in to the process, we don't have confidence in the process or the product because we haven't done enough background research um, to give us the confidence that their product's right. It could be, it could not be, but in, in most instances we want to work in a collaborative uh, way with our developer clients and the, and the best ones are, are collaborators, not dictators. And we work well with them and, you know, if we need some help uh, with some technical detail, for example, they're happy to whiz down to the display centres, they're happy to meet customers, they're available and they've got a passion and they enjoy it. And we share that passion and thrive off that passion. And so for the little developer that's sitting out there listening to this show who's maybe got some stock and the market's soft and they're sitting there thinking, how am I going to get sales away? What advice would you have for them? Uh, uh, first thing is, is understand the market. So depending on where they are, have a thorough understanding of where the market's at and seeing where their product fits into that market, whether it's right or wrong. Because if, if it's not selling, um, there's two reasons why it's not selling. Either the product's wrong for the market, and when I say it's, it's wrong, uh, it's, it's priced incorrectly, 
um, or it's designed inappropriately for the market. Um, and the second thing is uh, it hasn't been promoted correctly to the target market. So often you'll see um, agents uh, and inexperienced people that are probably trying to run a project sales but they they run a, a domestic real estate business so they're used to the 60 day auctions you know private sale uh, rhythm um, go into project marketing uh, they're distracted by their other core business they're not focused on the projects they they tend to run at what we call a spray and prey type uh, marketing approach where they'll just put the same renders in and big ads everywhere and blame the market if it's not selling where it might be you know a matter of um, segment and sell so segment the market target a specific audience and sell the product so it's it for them is if, you, if they have a deep understanding of the market they should be able to work that out pretty quickly and then what about some t- sort of targeted tactical activities social mm-hmm. advertising if they've got one of the, the there's a number of things that um, they need to, I suppose, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? They need to review. So the first thing is um, if they've got existing sales in their developments, they need to understand who the customers are and get a real deep understanding of their motivation. And then that will help inform them how they target customers like them. Find out where they've come from. Um, and, you know, there's things like... Um, and, and, and interviewing the existing purchasers. So the developers could do that themselves or through the agents and ask them how they came across the project, what they liked about it, um, what they didn't like about it, how they found the sales process. So, you know, the, the worst thing is if uh, you do get a, a qualified customer to your door and your sales collateral it's not in line with your product, uh, there's a mismatch, you don't get the confidence of the consumer, the buyer, and the sales falls over or you don't get the sale. So you, you know, they, they need to do, uh, I suppose, a complete review of the whole sales process. You know, I was looking at a, a project this week where, um, this is about one percenters, where the, I was for, for a client that's wanting us to take over a project and they had some townhouses and they said, oh, everyone wants four bedrooms. And I said, have you got four bedroom townhouses? Yes, we have. They're in this price category. And I'm like, that sounds right. And I said, can I have a look at the plan? And I was interviewing the, the sales agent that works for the devel- developer directly. And I said to him, um, it's, what do you like about this plan? He said, the plan's great. And I said, any buyer objections to this plan? He says, oh, well, there isn't a bathroom downstairs. And I said, well, so who are the buyers? And they said, well, they're often multi-generational homes where they'll have in-laws that are uh, living with them and if because they don't have a bathroom downstairs, uh, they, they can't purchase this product. And I'm looking at the powder room downstairs, which is enormous, and for the cost of $5,000, they could accommodate a shower, and that problem was fixed, and it opens up the floodgates for sales. So it, it's something as simple as that. So it's, it, it's, it's a one percenter in reviewing the plans to make sure the plans are right when the buyer gets there and then understanding the market. Okay, then, then multi-generational purchases. Let's target that audience. They've got, to, they've got to have in-laws living with them. So let's build a profile on them and target those specific people that live in this area through social media, for example, um, or through your database and get them back in. And then what's going to stimulate them? What's going to get them here? Do we need to hold an event? Is it an events-based marketing exercise? Is it a combination? Um, Is it a limited release? How do we create a sense of urgency? So there's never a silver bullet. You know, there's there's multiple approaches and it's a matter of just really finessing everything we do to maximise the opportunity every time. And I wanted to ask you, I think on one of your social posts, you mentioned something about having the right product for the market. And I think you. I think you, what you were saying is that you're finding a lot of three-level stock with or a reverse living stock was not meeting the expectations of the market. Is, is that correct? Am I Ta- townhouses. Townhouses. Yeah. So that was a particular uh, video on townhouses. So we uh, we sell a large volume of townhouses. Um, 
un unless there is a distinct advantage to first floor living, like it opens up a, an ocean view or a park view or something, generally we, we've seen in the market there's a, an aversion towards first floor living because we're finding that um, the townhouse buyers are particularly, uh, traditionally two groups, uh, the first being upsizes, so they're perhaps trading out of a, an apartment into a, a home, a townhouse we call it, and they'll generally have young children. So they want to, for, from a security point of view, if they're cooking in the kitchen, they want to be able to look straight through to their garden where their kids are playing and be able to keep an eye on them. So reverse living doesn't really work for that. If they're upstairs in the kitchen, kids are downstairs, they can't keep an eye on young children, so it never really works. There's the downsizer market who is ageing and doesn't like the stairs, so three levels is never going to work for them. Um, so, you know, we're... We generally um, try and get the where we can accommodate the living space on the ground level, we will, um, unless, as I said, it, it opens up a particular view, which uh, is a trade-off often. You know, for example, um, if you're on Beaconsfield Parade here in Middle Park, um, you'd have first floor living because it would give you a spectacular view and you'd be happy with that. But if you're out at um, Point Cook, for example, and you're looking over the neighbour's fence um, from the first floor, it's absolutely no advantage at all. Yeah, well, I think the comment I made was that it's a, having to go up was an inevitable outcome of the planning changes that were made in Victoria that had compulsory open sort of garden space areas. So developers are forced to go up to be able to get a yield that makes a site work. So I think... It's probably, you're probably going to see more of that. But. The, 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 the new um, better design standards and the new planning scheme is, uh, is not a bad thing. Uh, from my point of view, it's creating a better quality product um, that will have more enduring value for years to come. Uh, they're going to be slightly bigger, they're going to have more light, they'll have more cross slow ventilation and, as you're saying, more garden. So uh, the developers have less of a yield, but, you know, the market will self-regulate and adapt. Site values will come down because you can get less on them and uh, ultimately there'll be a better quality of product being supplied to the market. So I'm happy about these planning changes. OK. Well, let's switch gears a little bit as we approach the finish line. What's the toughest business decision you reckon you've ever had to make? Um, it's, it's always around people. For me, um, the success of our business is, is always about uh, the people we do business with and the people we employ. Um, and we've had some incredible staff through this business and often as the market changes and the business expands and attracts in accordance with the market, we've had to let go of some good people. And we've recently let go of, of someone that was here for eight years, which was really hard for me personally, really hard. And that that's, was probably one of the toughest things. Um, aside from starting the business where, you know, I was 40, I had um, a pregnant wife, I had to sell um, our family home to fund the business um, and we were in the GFC and everyone was telling me I was crazy and, uh, you know, that was a massive decision. I used to come home at night, you know, just stressed, working around the clock doing everything. Um, but, you know, I looked back at those memories now and I think what, what a great time it was you know it was growing and it's still growing and it's it's been an amazing journey for for, for me and, and and the staff and my family it's been great and what about the best piece of advice you've ever been given I was really um in terms of project marketing or business or either or uh, well, there's probably two pieces of advice. Um, Peter Rigetti, uh, my first job um, <coughs> when I was in property management, he, he basically just threw the Residential Tenancies Act at me and he said, well, learn that and start a property management business. So I had to go and build this whole property management. But he, he just said just two things. He said, um, respect people and always be courteous. Um, so that was 
a, a really important fundamental of, of the way I've run business is just respecting people and not getting ahead of yourself. Uh, in terms of um, project marketing, uh, I was very fortunate to work for the likes of Mervac and Australand and Beckton who did their own construction. So uh, understanding you know, the other side of the, the, the table, the feasibility and, and the structure and how that affects price and everything else. And really, the, the fundamental lesson that I've learned there that has held uh, me in good stead and the business in good stead is, is designing the right product. If you design the product to the market, it will sell itself. You know, people think it's, it's always about um, the st- marketing strategies and everything else, but if, if we design it and we design it appropriately for the target market and the opportunity, it should sell itself. And so we really focus on the product up front and where the opportunity is in the market. We don't want to uh, present a generic opportunity because it won't sell itself. It's got to be a unique opportunity in that market. And it doesn't mean that we're we're fundamentally changing everything, but it, it can be slight changes, you know, getting back to the one percenters that we talk about commonly in this business. You know, it's just a little finessing here and there to create, you know, a point of difference in a marketplace. So we talk about designing the right product. It's, it's not only the built form, it's the marketing paddock package, it's the display suite, it's the customer journey, it's the uh, sales follow-up process, it's, it's everything. And then what about your top tip for developers out there who'd be looking to take their business to the next level? Um, I think focus on quality always. So try and buy the best sites uh, uh, in the suburbs. Deliver on your promise always. People always look at your track record and be true to yourself. So, you know, and, and try and create something that you think is unique to, and attractive to the market. And, you know, just be genuine, be yourself. And I think, you know, I look at this business where, you know, there's always someone that uh, people are trying to emulate and be the same as. But I think, you know, use your personality to your advantage and be who you are and, you know, yeah, and have fun and enjoy it, really. You know, we're not around forever, so enjoy your time here, yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have a view on whether the developer should be involved in any of the marketing materials in terms of you know, fronting a video, perhaps trying to explain their vision or their idea of what the story was behind the product? I think definitely you need to have the developer involved because you've got to deliver on his message. You know, you're representing the developer every time. Um, whether they need to be front and centre depends on the individual and if they're that type of person. Um, but it, they, they certainly might want to be involved in the background to get the messaging right and, you know, so that, that their message and their vision is delivered through to the public. All right, and almost one last question. What's the absolute worst thing someone could make you spend an hour doing? Um, I, I, I struggle at project workshops because I, I find that there's too many people in the room, too many opinions, and um, as people will tell you, I, I'm not the most patient person alive, so you know I like to get stuff done and, and I like to get traction quickly, and where there's people that don't have an understanding of the market in the room or the target market, and I know I'm wasting my time, it infuriates me. So if I get involved in these big project workshops where they have you know, uh, all in sundry in the room and there's hundreds of people with different opinions and and none of them are relevant to the market or the target market and I know I'm wasting my time. That really upsets me. (laughs) (laughs) All right, John. Well, just finally, where can people find out more about you or about 360 Property Group if they're interested? Go to our website, you know, uh, www.the360propertygroup.com.au is there a story behind the name for the business? There is, because uh, having worked uh, with Australand and Beckton uh, and Mervac, uh, one of the big issues was that there was no one that, you know, when we first started the business, uh, project markers were the guys that uh, traditionally just supplied the sales personnel and then left. So there was no input up front into the research, the target market, the product. 
and then there was no one around at the end to help provide finance and settle the product and the site acquisition for the next project going forward. So we wanted to provide that whole 360 circular service, hence the name. Oh, very good. Well, I have really enjoyed sitting here speaking with you today. I'm glad I finally got to be able to sit down and have some time with you. I'm really grateful to you for all the insights that you've shared and you've been very open and provided some really interesting ideas and things to think about. So thank you, John. Pleasure, Justin. Thanks for having me on the show. See you later. Bye. Okay, there you go. Some absolute solid gold bullion in that conversation about how you go about marketing and selling property developments. I really enjoyed my chat with John and took these points away with me. 1. Think beyond digital boundaries. I love John's comment about what would you do if you parachuted into an area with no digital backup and had to make some sales? What would you do? Who would you talk to? How would you start? This is a great way of thinking beyond portal listings or social media advertising to add some breadth to your marketing campaign. So give some thought to how you might market your developments without any digital channels. 2. Segment, target and sell. This simple formula is all about understanding who are the likely buyers of your product. What are their motivations? Where are they hanging out before they look at your online listing? What are they looking for in their next property? I like John's suggestion of interviewing existing purchasers, if you have any, to see what they like or didn't like about your marketing materials or process. And how did they find your project? These are all great ways to find out who you should be targeting and what messages might resonate with them. Three, develop a deep understanding of the market. How deeply do you understand the market you're selling in? Do you feel like you're on top of the trends and demands of buyers in the area? Is there a gap in what is being asked for and what is available? Can you make any connections with local community groups like trader associations or sporting clubs to help expand the reach of your message? You can use all this local intelligence to shape and form your product and project. And finally, John encouraged a relentless focus on quality, which I agree with. If you enjoyed the discussion around project marketing, then maybe go back to the awesome conversation I had with Andy Hoyne in episodes 47 and 48, where we talked about how you can get 200 people lining up to buy into your project. Andy had these gems of advice. Actually, here's the thing. In a hot market, people get lazy. They just deliver product. There's a whole lot less care about, you know, what can we do that's gonna be compelling. So, as crazy as it sounds, A difficult market is far more exciting to me because you have to work harder, you have to think harder, and you have to ensure that what you do is going to actually get people's attention. And I'm happy to sort of be a risk taker because for me, if you actually really believe in the project, all you can really see is upside. You know, that risk just dissipates when you know that what it is you're taking to market has an incredibly strong audience, a strong amount of consumer desire. Um, and that you have the ability to achieve a greater upside uh, because of maybe what's happening with the market, even when it's weak, or uh, maybe because there's just not many competitors around, or maybe because you're doing something so different that uh, people are going to line up to be a part of it. There is an enormous amount of value in those two episodes, so go back and take a listen to episode 47 and 48. Remember to contact me if you're interested in learning how to develop property safely and profitably. Email justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com for some info. Don't forget to catch me on Insta and Facebook via Property Developer Podcast for my latest project picks and videos, industry news, and other fun tidbits. You can also post a comment on iTunes if you're enjoying the show. And, of course, all the past episodes of the show can be found at propertydeveloperpodcast.com. So, until next time, may your sales velocity be fast and furious. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.